In our house, one of the most beloved storybooks is the paper bag princess. Now, if you don't know this story, it begins like a regular princess story. But this time, the dragon kidnaps the prince and burns the princess's castle. So the princess Elizabeth dons the only thing that she can find, which was a paper bag. And off she goes to save her prince. Elizabeth goes on to defeat the dragon, not through strength, but through wit and wisdom. But her prince, Ronald, is thoroughly unimpressed because she doesn't look like a princess. And this book has, it turns out, a happily ever after, but it's not the kind that we are taught to expect from princess stories. Instead of the marriage of the prince and princess, Elizabeth dumps Ronald and dances off into the sunset all by herself. <laughs> How often do we decide that an ending isn't a happy one because it doesn't look like the one we expect? Take Mark's gospel, for instance. The last verse that we read today where the women witness the resurrection, but they don't say anything to anyone because they're afraid, you should know that's the end. That's the last verse of the whole book. Not much of a happily ever after, is it? And you know, way back in the beginning when Mark started this gospel, he called it good news. But if this is good news, what do we make of this ending? Perhaps the good news of this story, even its ending, exists beyond the last words. Now, it, it is a pretty cryptic ending, one that throughout the ages some Christians have found upsetting. So unsettling, in fact, that early scribes created at least two additional endings to Mark's gospel. You can find them in most Bibles. They're not very good endings. <laughs> the scribes didn't even try to match Mark's tone and vocabulary. But you can see how each one tries to like give a tidy bow to tie up the gospel. But often these works end up redoing everything that Mark's gospel tried to undo. For example, they restore a male-dominated hierarchy all but erasing the women who alone follow Jesus to and through the cross and show up at the empty tomb. They establish norms of right belief, what we might call orthodoxy, even though Mark is not at all concerned with proper belief, let alone the unbelief that Mark's longer ending condemns. In both of these extra endings, Jesus sends the disciples out to the ends of the earth which la with language that makes the church look an awful lot like the Roman Empire. <laughs> so troubled by the unexpected and abrupt ending, the ancient scribes tried to give the gospel the happy conclusion that they felt it lacked. But here's what they miss. The gospel isn't good news because it has a happy, tidy conclusion. The gospel is good news because the story doesn't end with its final words. Look, the young man who greets the women in the tomb tells them that Jesus is going ahead of them to Galilee. But nobody seems to go to Galilee, right? When the story ends so strangely, one thing that we might do is go back to the beginning and see, hang on a second, did I miss something here? And then, just like Mark's original audience, we come back to the story with these expectations, like, what is this compelling story that people are willing to give up their lives for it? And how is this story so lasting that we're still telling it decades and then centuries and now millennia later with an ending like this? So... We begin again searching for the risen Jesus, and we find him at the beginning of Mark's gospel in Galilee. And we see him calling the disciples and Peter and sending them out into mission. And we see Jesus teaching and healing and challenging authority. It's like the story is beginning again. As biblical scholar Chad Myers notes, 
the story is circular. Unlike all the other Gospels, even unlike St. Paul, Mark never shows us the resurrected Jesus. Jesus doesn't appear to bury Magdalene in the garden or to the myrrh bearers, these faithful women who go early to the tomb, nor does he appear to Peter, Thomas, or any member of the Twelve. But if the story is circular, then the entire gospel is a resurrection appearance. When Mark's ending sends us back to the start, we read the words, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in a whole new light. Now we see that the story is also about what the resurrected Jesus is all about. Author of new life, worker of miracles, teller of stories, and restorer of relationships. We still have to wonder, if the women told no one, how is it that we have the story at all? How is it told such that we have it here to tell today if it didn't go any further than that? Of course, since the beginning of the gospel, throughout the Galilean ministry, there has been another witness. Someone else journeyed from the, the Mount of Transfiguration back to Jerusalem. Someone else who, with the women, gazed upon the cross. And now, even at the empty tomb, there is another witness. Someone else has heard this story from the beginning. Someone else knows that Jesus is risen. Surely you know who by now, yes? The other witness is you. And if that is true, then this story is not good news because of its ending. It is good news because it continues in you. It is good news because it continues in your life. If the story is ending, it is only because the good news has found a beginning in you. I want to tell you one more thing. In some of the other Gospels, the women are told by an angel that Jesus is risen. But in this Gospel, it's not an angel. It's a young man. Way back in the Garden of Gethsemane, there was a young man clothed in linen in what has to be one of the weirdest details in the entire Bible, one of the guards seizes this kid by his clothing, but he manages to wiggle out of it and runs away naked. And there's no other young man in the gospel at all, so we are to presume that this is the same person. His old linen clothes and that word for it is the same word that describes the shroud that Jesus was buried in. They have been replaced with dazzling white clothing. This is the word that describes Jesus' clothing when he was transfigured. And it also describes the white-robed martyrs of Revelation. Chad Meyer says this fact inspires both hope and terror. Hope in that he who once joined the ranks of the naked shame of abandonment now stands in new, new attire. Terror and that his new clothes are also that of a martyr figure. This young person, in and of themselves, is a beginning and an ending. And I mention him to you because on this Easter Sunday, you might be someone holding on to something that feels like quite the opposite of good news. Perhaps you are seized by terror and haven't said anything to anyone because you are afraid. We live in a world that tends to believe that if this is the ending you have, you probably deserved it. Not only does Mark go to great pains to explain that this is not the ending that Jesus deserves, the cross, he goes to great pains to ask, who even needs an ending? It might be hard to hear and hold this good news, beloved, but if Jesus' ending 
is just a beginning. If the good news is that the story goes on and on and on, then so too for you. What looks like an ending, however terrifying or shameful, is always the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ in your life. Happy Easter, beloved. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.